everybody. This is another episode of Conversations with Annie and Kate. And hello, Annie. And we have our guest, Erin Riley, tonight. And Annie's going to introduce her. Hey, folks. We are super delighted to welcome Erin to the podcast this evening. She is a writer, a student, a professional communicator, and of course, very importantly, probably the best job of all, a parent. Um, she's really interested in how to make the world a better place and whatever she can do to help anyone get there. Erin's in her second year of PhD in communication at UTS, uh, looking at developing best practice for engaging with stakeholders who are hurt by public policy decisions. Frankly, there's a lot of that going on. We could probably talk for about four hours just on that alone. Um, and she's also the co-founder of an incredible company called Find a Bed, which is an organization that matches people who've been affected by bushfires and people who can provide accommodation or help in other ways. Erin has written extensively about issues from sport and gender to parenting and baking, also important. Um, her work has appeared in the Sydney Morning Herald, The Age, ABC Online, SBS, The Guardian, and she's also the media lead for the 2017 Women's March in Sydney, which I actually didn't know, Erin. Yeah. I learned something new every day about. Um, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I'm... It's such a great way to end the week, isn't it? Oh, it's lovely. It's nice having something to look forward to. And, and it's the perfect thing. weather for it. It's just oh, yeah. the right weather to sit around and have a chat. Because I've had so a, first, a hard week, so I needed... You've had a hard week. So first question, Kate, what are you drinking? I am drinking something called Eight at the Gate. Oh, I've had that before, it's quite nice. A 2015 Cab Sav from South Australia. I am drinking a Jones Block uh, McLaren Vale Shiraz 2018. It's very nice, I'm about halfway through it already. Not... By the way, I haven't drunk half a bottle of wine already. It is only just after half past seven in the evening. I started it yesterday. I'm not a complete pisshead. Erin, what are you drinking? I am having a Negroni made by my partner, who is quite the excellent Negroni maker. Nice. Yes. Good skill. We, uh, we got very into them last year during lockdown. It's good that you've got your crane. That's an excellent thing. I'm, I'm not complaining. <laughs> Do you want to ask the first question, Kate? I will, and and because you've got such a full agenda with all of the all of those things that you're doing, I'm going to ask about: um, Do you practice self care, and if you do, what do you do, and why do you do it? I do. Um, I try really hard to make time for exercise at least three or four times a week, um, and I have been going to the gym fairly regularly for the last year, which I find is really important for me. Uh, it makes a real difference in how I'm feeling and uh, it really is the time that's just for me. I'm also a obsessive bath taker. Um, I love a bath. If I go more than two or three days without a bath, I don't feel right. So I, fortunately we live in a shed. It's a bit of a long story, but we don't actually have a shower. We just have a bath. So I, at the moment, I pretty much have a bath every day and that sort of 45 minutes is really crucial for me. You are speaking, not to me, by the way, because I'm perimenopause, so I can't go any, anywhere near anything hot. Uh, however, Kate is also a beloved uh, lover of baths, aren't you, my friend? I have a rubbish bathtub, so I go to Annie's place. <laughs> we have really nice ones here, and <laughs> guests frequently come just to have a bath. That is excellent. I love that. Uh, we can, we're going to, oh, I'm going to have to ask you the question about why you're living in a shed later on. Um, <laughs> but my other, you know, sort of, uh, this is my favorite question I always like to ask. Yeah. If you could go back to your younger self and tell yourself something that you wish you'd known back then that you know now, what would you tell yourself? This is a really silly one, but I really wish someone had told me this at 21 don't drink at a work function. I made well, so drink. many mistakes at, by drinking at work functions. And there is nothing that, you know, yes, it was free booze. I could have spent $10 on a bottle of wine and had the same amount of alcohol and saved myself so many red faces at work. Um, maybe once, but uh, as a woman in my 
mid to late thirties. I I genuinely wish I could tell twenty five year old Erin just don't, just save it for mm. when you're with friends. Yeah, it's a really sensible point, and I'm sitting here going, "What's the?" In fact, probably the worst story I've got from drinking to excess at a work and I actually ended up in hospital with uh, I needed stitches in my head and I'd broken two ribs from accidentally falling off a wall in Sardinia of all places. Oh dear! Uh, so I ended up in hospital. yeah, waking up in a random kind of hospital bed and this nurse was speaking in Italian at me and I was like I don't know where I am I was also hungover and she was gluing part of my head back together yeah don't drink at work functions don't drink at work it's functions not- it's just not worth it yeah I agree I agree and it took me, it took Good me to work it out too yeah, honestly, at any time a young woman, in particular women, who asks me for advice in their career, that's one of the things I say. I'm like, just trust me, leave early, buy a glass of wine, like buy a bottle of wine on the way home, you will thank me later. Yeah, <laughs> that's good advice. So Erin, what, um, what made you kind of go back into studying again? What, what was it that sort of made you go and start doing a PhD? So the shed and the PhD are all sort of related. Um, That's good because we want to know about the shed. Yeah, so it's kind of a single story in a way. Um, Actually, I I should jump back a little way. So I have a a four and a half year old, almost. Um, And she was a bit of a surprise. I had been dating my partner for about six weeks when I fell pregnant. Um, and I have PCOS, so it wasn't supposed to be very easy for me to fall pregnant, and I was on the pill. Um, and so I was 32 at the time, and I thought, might not happen again, this might be my only chance. And so, uh, in conversation with my then very new boyfriend, <laughs> who is now my partner of five years, um, we decided to, to have the baby and try and work, to, work it out together. Um, so all of that was very surprising. I had just quit my government job where I had really good maternity leave and benefits uh, to go and pursue my dream of writing full time. So I had no maternity leave, nothing. Yeah, it was a pretty difficult time. Um, and then we moved to Panania. So we were living in the inner city at the time. Then we moved to Panania. Um, and after about 18 months, oh, yeah, 18 months there, we were struggling a bit um working out this parenting and living together and uh, all these bits and pieces so we decided to uh, move into the shed at my parents house now it's a nice shed it's a three-bedroom apartment in a shed but it is a shed I have the mice to prove it um particularly with the mouse plague at the moment um but yeah, so we moved out here and it was only supposed to be for 12 months so we could sort of get on our feet, get financially ahead a little bit and just settle down. Uh, and that was almost three years ago. Um, after about 12 months, my father was diagnosed with motor neuron disease. Uh, so he was diagnosed almost two years ago now. And that changed a lot of things. I was working long hours on site for a construction company doing community engagement so it was sort of three to four hours a day of commuting plus 10 hour days um and I wanted time with my dad so rather than getting out of there you know pursuing the big bucks all those sorts of things we decided I decided to go back to uni and we um yeah we decided to stay in the shed for a while and and I sort of always wanted to study more and had this idea I spent some time doing uh working compulsory acquisition of property uh on the practitioner side and I thought there needs to be some more evidence-based practice for it so I could see that there was a real gap in the research and yeah so I applied and got a scholarship and the rest is history that's interesting. I hadn't realised that that was the genesis of it. Yeah, it's sort of, um, 
it was very much about lifestyle and uh, yeah, because I had decided I wanted to, st I knew I wanted to study at some point and it just felt like the right time. So it's really good. It means that I can get my daughter um, from daycare early and she can have afternoons with my dad and they can play together while he's still able to. Um, and I can support my mum because she needs a bit of help caring for him. So that's sort of the, the defining factor of our lives at the moment. It's, it's always interesting to me how women feel like they have options to do things like this. And, and it's a valid choice for women. Yeah, and it's mm. it, sort of that catch-22 where it, it's so such a privilege to have the opportunity to take sort of a career break, for want of a better term, so I can have that time, but also feeling the pressure to do, to be a carer because I def like, yeah, I've got two younger brothers and I definitely think I feel the, um, the need to care probably differently than they do. I certainly feel like they both still feel it, but I, I definitely think the role is a bit different. It's interesting you say that, Erin, because you probably know this. I've just got back from um, being in the UK for six months because my dad got diagnosed with leukemia. And it was just my instant reaction was, okay, well, I'm, I'm going back to the UK for a while. I don't know how long, but I can't just leave mum to do that by herself. And I'm not saying that my brother didn't want to help out. And of course he has and he does. And this is, um, this is a marathon, not a sprint as well. And I could take that six months right now, but he couldn't at the time. So it was just like, a, it was an obvious choice that I would go do that. But there's not one moment in my brain that went, is this the right thing to do? It was literally just an instant gut reaction of, yeah. well, I'm going to be booking a flight right now. And then there were a couple of people, you know, like um, Kate and other friends going, you just need to make sure you do it in the right way so that they let you back in again when you want to come back. Um, yeah, it was just, it was, and I'm grateful that I, I had that flexibility in my work schedule and all the other things to be able to go do it. But it was just, I'm going and I'm going to be there to help. Not like similar to what you just said, Erin, as well, that it's it's not just about your dad. It's also about you know, my mum and making sure she had someone that she could rely on too. Yeah. And honestly, what I do is not very big. It's things like we've got chickens and I feed the chickens in the morning so she doesn't have to get out of bed. And it's just the little things. But I'm so grateful for the opportunity to, to do them and to be here. Mm. Well, it's nice to be able to, to be there and to be around. My parents both died really suddenly, you know, and I didn't have a chance for any farewells. And I can't, I'm kind of jealous a bit of people who, who have that opportunity. Yeah, Makes sense. absolutely. Makes sense. My dad lost his mum very suddenly um, when he was about my age. And I am just really grateful for time where you can be conscious of the fact it's special. Yeah, so well said. Um, so how long, you're about two years into your PhD? Wasn't I'm it? just starting my second year, so just one year down. Oh, just one right. year. <laughs> Sorry. Well, what's the plan? It's just one year to go. Just one year to go. No, two years to go. What are you down? Two years to go. Um, I've just finished my uh, first year. We had a big presentation last Friday, and that was sort of uh, at UTS. You have to do a um, presentation every year to progress to the next year, or and an, a paper, uh, write a paper. Uh, and so that was all wrapped up last Friday. So I was a bit of a stressful wreck for about the last four months. I feel like I'm walking about three inches taller uh, since <laughs> last Friday. Uh, so I had a bit of a week off this week. Not that it was an actual week off, but it was a week off uni work. Uh, and then so how did the, how did the presentation go? What was I think it went well. Um, I always I have a bit of a problem as a ex-comms person I'm used to being really succinct and so I have really struggled to transition to academic writing because it's so not like that and this presentation was supposed to be 30 minutes and I thought 
I don't have 30 minutes of content. I'm going to bore everyone with silly details if I go on for 30 minutes. So I wound up only going for 20 and they said it was fine. But and that is something I've really, really struggled with because I'm used to, you know, 400 or 600 words, uh, 10, 20 minute presentations. The idea of speaking for 30 minutes about one thing is really new to me. That's, that's something I've not thought of that. Because I've always stayed sort of in part in academia. I've never, and I, I, but I've done comms. So I've done both in parallel, but I just think of them as different worlds. They are entirely different worlds and they're entirely different skill sets. So it, it's really humbling to be someone who, you know, I, I pride myself on being a good writer. And then to get feedback from my supervisor being like, this is terribly written, <laughs> but I'm a, I can write. It, it's been a real, it's been a real challenge and a real sort of ego thing. And I've wound up doing a lot of reading about mindset and resilience and um, that kind of stick with it thing that I haven't really always had. So it's been a real, I've been amazed at that part of it. Uh, I wasn't anticipating so much personal growth. Uh, you kind of think, I've been business, you know, worked for 15 years. I've done a lot of tough jobs. What is there to learn? And not uh, so much to learn. It's good to obviously be learning and challenging yourself, I guess. Um, but what's the, what's the thing that you want to do with the PhD after you get it? Because you obviously will. I have this idea, my dream life is teaching a third of the time, consulting around comms that I care about, about a third of the time, and baking about a third of the time. That's what I, <laughs> that's the dream. I think hopefully at the end, it'll be more like 50-50, um, the comms and the, the teaching, and then maybe the baking can work its way a, bit of baking a little bit later. Side. Yeah. I love have you, have you have you mainlined all of the Great British Bake Off shows? Of course, it's fantastic. No, I so I do um, a particular kind of cookie decorating. So I do royal icing decorating. Mm -hmm. That's my little niche. Yep. So I do these very. Um, I'm not very good by any stretch of the imagination. I'm in these groups, and some of the women in there, because it's almost all women, are just artists. And they do these incredible things, um, but I'm learning and it's been a really lovely outlet for me. Um, mm. But I don't actually, we don't actually have a kitchen in the shed. So I can only do my, and it takes a long time to do these biscuits. So I can only do them when, so we're in the shed and mum and dad are in the main house. Uh, and I, so I can only do them when mum and dad are away. So every time they're like, I'm like, when are you going away? And when are you going? <laughs> and then I block out the day just to bake. <laughs> love it. I love that you've got something else that's very different to, you know, your sort of your main skill set. Sorry, well, work skill set, I guess, yeah. of, you know, writing and comms and the PhD. It's something that I'm, I'm always fascinated by people who are creative in lots and lots of different ways, because I'm not at all. I'm practical and I can help people build stuff and can talk for hours interestingly 30 minutes that's not a problem I can fill that <laughs> um but I can hike and I can be outdoors and I'm terribly practical so you know if, if whatever your other skill set is just I don't know something terribly practical I'd be totally fine baking yeah. not so much um I find I actually get it it is kind of a form of self-care for me actually uh, if I don't okay. bake, I have to be doing something that isn't to do with writing that is creative because writing is so much work now, um, or as in it's so associated with work. I do need to find my yeah. creative outlet somewhere else. Um, so I also sew. That's my other outlet. Interesting. I, I want to ask you about about the the beds thing, though. Yeah, find a bed. Find a bed, yeah. So, because I remember watching on Twitter as it kind of unfolded and unfurled. It was really interesting. Yeah, it was not what I'd planned to do that New Year's Eve. I actually had guests over. 
Um, and I kept having to excuse myself to check to make sure <laughs> what was going on. Um, yeah, so it started, do you want the whole story? Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. So it started, um, so where we live, we were not far from the Green Wattle Creek fire. Uh, and we, I knew a lot of people nearby were evacuating. And because we're on five acres, I thought, well, if people are evacuating with their horses, they might need somewhere to come with a horse. Because you can't really take a horse to an evacuation centre. I've since learned they actually set up evacuation centres where you can take your horse. But still, it's nicer not to be in an evacuation centre if you can avoid it. Um, so I just tweeted uh, that we had a place to stay and a couple of hundred people retweeted it. And, I thought, and then a couple of people replied in the comments saying, we've got something similar, we're here, we're there, we're happy to help. I just thought, there's got to be an easier way to do this. And so I set up two Google Forms that linked to Google Spreadsheets and a Wix website, and it took about 45 minutes. And one said, I need a place to stay. And one said, I've got a place to stay. People can stay. And I actually originally called it Share a Bed. And then I realised that, no, that was probably not the best name for it. Um, and then, yeah, within the first day we were contacted by a lady who's um by a woman whose husband uh was in his mid-70s and had been sleeping in his car the last two nights because he was stuck because the road was closed mm -hmm. and he was our very first match and it went from there and we wound up um, matching hundreds of people it was such a Sorry. thing and it was really amazing to see people just contributing to it in real life yeah it really gives you hope for humanity when you see things like that it does. And I think the other thing that, though, for me, that really always stood out was I think you, perhaps, and this is my, my observation from obviously you and I have spoken about Find a Bed a lot, Erin, and you've been on a panel with me and, and things like that. But um, I, I, I wondered whether or not you were kind of a little bit surprised at how it sort of took off. But one of the things I love about a really good idea done at the right time with the right you know sort of execution it can take off and it can take off so quickly because people can just well yes this is a great thing to do and you're absolutely right Kate and it does show the right parts of humanity and, and it literally did just completely snowball didn't it yeah we had eight and a half thousand people sign up to be hosts within two weeks um, it was incredible. We it's would put necessary, you know, people were without places to sleep. And were without places to sleep in really strange and specific ways. Like they were stuck in this particular suburb and that suburbs local evacuation center was completely full and people were sleeping on the floor in their car. Um, so we needed someone in that suburb. Mm -hmm. So it really was this very, it wasn't that there was need and you could meet it broadly. It had to be this really specific thing. Um, and we were just so fortunate that it did take off the way it did. And we were able to get so many people signed up on the list. And I, a lot of people were disappointed that they didn't get matched with someone, that they really wanted to host someone. And we had to say, you know, we just have to match them with need. Mm. And you had some really interesting kind of like, random stories as well didn't you so what do you want to tell yeah. them? my favorite one was still about the getting the um getting the caravan the caravan <laughs> yeah like someone one. had put out a call for um for a caravan for a um indigenous elder who lived in mogo who'd lost her home and she uh was saying that she wanted to just set up a tent on the paddock across the road from where her house was so she could keep an eye on the rebuild um so we put it out there and uh a, this lovely couple from the sunshine coast replied and said they had a caravan they were willing to donate but we just had to get it to sydney and no one person could do the whole trip and so we put out this request and es essentially we ferried it <laughs> from volunteer to volunteer down the coast. They took it to Byron. Someone picked it up in Byron and took it to Newcastle. Someone took it from Newcastle to Sydney. Someone took it from Sydney to Wollongong. And then I went down in Wollongong where um, Bunja Smith, who was the person who 
had originally put the call out, he came up and picked it up from us in, in Wollongong. Uh, and so it was just this love, it took about two days and it was just this lovely story that other people along the way offered to host it overnight and every stop <laughs> people added stuff to it. So by the time we got it to her, it was full. It was full of food and, you know, bedding and someone added a microwave and you name it cleaning supplies every way along every step along the way people put more and more into it so we we're able to well it was able to be delivered to her and we wound up I think it was about eight caravans that we organized in total um, but that was the first one and it was sort of this epic story that a lot of people followed it was really lovely um, we also had really funny stories around finding places for cows um, a lot of cows had to be evacuated and there wasn't really good coordinated um, help for people who were looking to relocate their cows. Like, like herds of cows? Like 500 cows. 500 <laughs> and we had to find cows? a place to put 500 cows. And we had multiple lots of cows that we had. And then so one of our, our amazing volunteer team wound up becoming a an expert in like the difference between cattle that have been fire affected and drought affected. And you can't just put fire affected cattle in certain things because their hooves are really sore. And there's all these different, because they walk on the ground when it's still hot and their oh. hooves get burnt. Wow. And there's all this stuff around. I think that was it. Was, yeah. Things, you just don't understand, do you? You don't, things are complex. I had no idea. Um, and the other one that was amazing was there was a 103 or 104 year old woman whose home burnt down and we needed to find an accessible place for her to stay. She was still living alone um, and she lost, they lost their family home and two of the other family members also lost their homes. Um, and yeah, they really needed a place. So we put it out there and someone came to us and it just so happened that his sister-in-law had been in a car accident and so was in a long-term recovery facility and had an accessible house while she was in recovery and this woman could stay there for months. Um, and also if we put up handrails and things, that would actually be quite helpful for yeah. the owner once she came back. So then we paid someone to come in and put the handrails in. And so it was all sorts of these very small and specific things, but there was a real gap in addressing that sort of thing at the time. It, it, you know, I've done a lot of work in social innovation, you know, in so we used to run social innovation Sydney with Selena Griffith. And it seems to me like th this might be an insight into a better way to do stuff than, than we do commercially, you know, sort of the, the needs markets sort of concept. Maybe there's a startup idea in that somewhere, Annie. There probably is, but I actually did want to ask you, Aaron. You know, after starting Find a Bed, and we're now, you know, a year and a bit later. Yeah. Um, are you still are you still operating it? What What are some of the challenges you faced along the way? We're sort of in hibernation mode at the moment. Fortunately, this year, so we we sort of jumped back into work when COVID first hit. Uh, we were doing a lot of accommodation for. Um, emergency service workers, uh, doctors, frontline workers who had to isolate from their families for um, medical reasons, but hadn't yet, there wasn't a government support yet for hotel stays mm -hmm. and, and the like. So we organised both through fundraising and through um, our list of people who had offered homes. We'd offer, we organised quite a few places for people to stay. Um, but after that sort of demand died down a bit. Um, there's quite a bit of work that I really need to do in the back end, making things, setting things up properly. We do want to be ready uh, next time there's a bush uh, season and ready to jump back into things. Uh, but this is very much a, I have not prioritized it um, over the last not, year and gearing up for the biblical floods <laughs> look it's bound to happen and i'm probably gonna have to go oh crap i'm gonna need some help and everyone has to jump back in again but um 
yeah, it's one of those things where I just would love a week of time that I could just put aside and sort everything out, but it's really hard to find. Well, the interesting thing, because you, you only, it was necessity was the mother of that invention. You know, you yeah. had to do it. Oh, sorry, you didn't have to do it. You chose to do it because you could see that there was a huge gap and you're like, to Google Sheets people, it's not hard. Um, and then it, it snowballed and then you said it, you know, sort of needed a new life when COVID first hit again. But yeah. it is going to happen again. And yeah, how do you how does your brain deal with that kind of the, the the balancing act of I'm doing a PhD I've got a daughter my father's got um, um, neuro and disease and I'm here to support him and be there for my mum and we live in a shed and it's infested with some rat, uh, some mice because mice. that's the other thing <laughs> most the mice. yeah but super fun yeah it's kind of like you've got more than enough going on oh, and I also and run yeah. my own small business of course, because I, you know, I, I do a little. I have a little comms consultancy I run on the side. So, right, uh, yeah, you're not so, busy enough. You know, you need no, exactly. <laughs> so you 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 you, you you chose to create find a bed because you knew that it was necessary and it was needed and it was very much a, a gap. Yeah. You know, it's going to happen again, and yet you're already ridiculously busy. How do you? How do you just deal with all the plates that you've got spinning at the same time? Um, sometimes not well. Sometimes I drop them. Um, mm -hmm. I had a really interesting um, email. I, I, I'd been having, I had a personal trainer for the last year because I was trying to get fitter and stronger and and I got an email from her the other day, a couple of weeks ago, about um, where she, you know, kind of had a go at me for not being committed. I saw enough. it on Facebook. It was gobsmacking. Yes. I, I'm, I'm being was, gentle. She kind of had a go at seriously me. Seriously offensive. Are you going to read it? I, I, I can. You need, you need to see it, Annie. If you haven't, if you haven't heard it, it was I haven't truly seen it. offensive. It was a truly offensive email. Um. Yeah, she sort of said, you know, you're not sticking to your goals. You're not training enough. You have to get exercise in every day. I don't know if this is just a part, you know, if, if it's a time management issue for you. Um, and I, I, I kind of sat on it. I cried at first. I absolutely bawled. Um, and then I kind of sat on it for a day. And then I sent her an email that just said, look, I manage my priorities just fine. They're just not the same as yours. And for me at the moment, exercise, and this was two weeks after my grandfather had passed away. Yeah. Um, so I was like, this is not my priority right now. And it's something I enjoy and I value, but I'm an adult and sometimes I have to prioritize other things. Um, and I think that's sort of my approach more broadly that, sometimes you just yeah sometimes I just say no this is not the time for this and I might get a little bit behind in my PhD or I have to say to a client I can't pick up this piece of work I don't have the capacity right now um I also have a partner who is quite understanding and uh has was amazing during uh find a bed and was picked up a whole lot of childcare. he um wouldn't have done wouldn't have been doing otherwise it would have been more 50 50 where it was not 50 50 when find a bed was was really busy it's an interesting point around you know, the it's okay to say no to things and it's okay to let the plate fall every now and again it's okay yeah. it doesn't end the world and Occasionally you'll get someone and it does hurt the relationship, but if they're not understanding enough to see that you have to prioritize and you have to make decisions that are consistent with your own values and your own priorities, then it was probably not a great relationship to begin with. Um, no. And that's something I've gotten. You know, I was just going to say, I hope you know, to see that personal trainer, by the way. Oh no, no. She was sacked that email like straight away. <laughs> In fact, when I tweeted it, I said, how to lose a client in one email. 
it was, it was really interesting because a it was a woman and it's always a surprise i don't know why it's always a surprise when it's a woman because there's you know insensitive women too but it was just really really you've got so such little eq that you don't realize this is a completely offensive email to someone whose grandfather's just died it's just like really and she knew that i had this big assignment for uni and i turned it in on the friday yeah and then she had to go at me on the Sunday for not getting to the gym over the weekend. Forget about her and move on. But it's a very good story, I think. Um, I'm really interested in um, your choice of partner because, you know, he, he seems to be working out quite well. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, it, was a, it was a really surprising beginning, I know, for, for the both of you. Um, but how, how is that going? It seems to be going really well. Yeah, it, it, it's really good and it just gets better. Um, we had some rough times in the first couple of years. Uh, probably about two, when Abby was about two was probably when it was the hardest so far. Um, but we, I think we're a good match in terms of personality and we understand each other pretty well. We're, I'm a big communicator and I'm a big talk to me about what, how you're feeling talk to me about how you're doing you know are you okay right now um and he's probably a lot more reticent with that stuff oh I've set Siri off in the background um <laughs> uh but we we find we find a really good com good common ground we're both people who definitely need alone time um, and that works for us too, that we can both say, I just don't want to talk right now. I just want to read a book or watch a movie or that sort of thing. He's also just a really great dad and a really great partner in terms of a partner in raising a kid. And I think that goes a long way too. Plus I just love him. <laughs> Lovely. That, that helps. Yeah. I, I think the choice of one's partner is probably the most important choice in a woman's life that can affect you for good or ill for a very long time. Absolutely. And, and it, it's funny because choice is a funny word with us. Sometimes it didn't feel like a lot of it. I mean, it was. It was a choice um, to commit to each other and it was a choice to raise our daughter together. And um, But sometimes I think that facing that, big thing so early in our relationship really gave us a strong foundation and and you you made a choice you both made a choice a conscious choice which is probably as good a way to start anything as any other yeah but funny story um my car completely died about two weeks ago I was driving Abby to the museum on a Sunday morning and she needed to go to the bathroom because a child can't go an hour without going to the bathroom. So I pulled off the motorway and went into McDonald's and my car was working fine. She went to the loo. We came back out. My car wouldn't get out of second gear. And this was my dream car. I'd wanted this car for so long. I dreamt about having a Volkswagen Jetta when I was 13. I finally got one last year and yeah, it wouldn't get out of second. Uh, so I drove, parked at the station we took the train in because you can't tell a four-year-old that, sorry, the museum trips are not off because mummy's car's not working. Uh, we got there just in time, thankfully. Uh, but when I came back the next day, picked it up and took it to a local mechanic, they said there was nothing they could do. This car that I bought a year ago uh, was completely, like, there was nothing. It was going to cost more to fix than it was worth. So. That's yeah, it's a particular thing with this generation of Volkswagens. They have a direct shift gearbox and when it goes, it goes. Um, so I'd completely, like, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I'm a uni student. I'm on uni student money, um, which is to say not much. Uh, and I was really stressed about, because, you know, I'd spent almost $10,000 on this car a year ago and now it's completely worthless. Um, and then my parents turned around and said, well, we've got money we put aside for your wedding and we don't think that's going to happen because <laughs> we've been together five years and we've got a kid. So uh, would you like your wedding money to buy a new car? So I did uh, cashed in the shares that they had put aside for 
a future wedding and now I have a very daggy Vox, uh, Toyota Corolla that will be very cheap to fix and I like them because they're reliable so a good a good choice a very good sensible choice. I had my fun car now I have my sensible car <laughs> and I think this is probably a good place for us to finish uh, so thanks very much Erin it's been lovely talking to you nice to see you again Annie lovely to have you back in the time zone thank you thank you so much for having me this was so much fun it is fun we always <laughs> enjoy it